Welcome to week one of our course, The Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. This is the first lecture. Now, let me start with something that you have probably most of you have seen before. And that is that whenever we talk about any material, like an atom or a molecule or a solid, we draw a set of energy levels. And the picture we have in mind is that the electrons in that material can occupy these energy levels. And usually left to itself at equilibrium, the electrons tend to go to the lowest energy levels. Now, why don't they all crowd into the same one? Well, that's where we invoke the exclusion principle and say that each level can at most accommodate one electron. And so the lowest levels are usually filled and the high upper levels are empty. And at low temperatures, there's a nice clean dividing line between them, which we call the electrochemical potential or mu. But as you raise the temperature, that dividing line becomes more diffuse. And so you use something called the Fermi function. And this Fermi function here, that's what I've plotted here on the horizontal axis, whereas on the vertical axis, I have this dimensionless quantity, which tells you how far the level is from the electrochemical potential normalized to the thermal energy, Kt, where K is this Boltzmann's constant and T is the absolute temperature. Now, when you consider levels that are way above the electrochemical potential up here, that's when the Fermi function is zero, indicating that the level is surely empty. When you are down here, way below the electrochemical potential, that's when the Fermi function is one, indicating that the level is surely full. And in between, it changes from zero to one. It's like at this point, it's 0.5. What does that mean? Well, not that there's half an electron there. What it means is that that levels there are sometimes full and sometimes empty, and the average occupation is 0.5. Anyway, so this is the Fermi function that you have probably seen before. But what I really want to talk about this week and in this course in general is a much more general law, Boltzmann law, which applies to all systems in equilibrium. So it doesn't matter how complicated or simple it is. So for example, you may have heard of the Bose-Einstein distribution that's obeyed by photons. Well, that too comes out of the Boltzmann law, although we won't be talking about it. Now, in order to explain the Boltzmann law, I need to introduce this concept of state space, which is a very important concept in this entire course in general. So the idea is that you see, if you have a bunch of levels, what you might call the one electron levels, each one of those levels can be in one of two possible states. It can be either full or empty. That's the zero state or the one state. So each level has these two possibilities. And so when you want to describe the states of the entire system, then you have to write a, like a binary number, something like this. You have to say 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, meaning the first state is full, the second state is empty, the third state is empty, fourth state is full, fifth state is full, and so on. So how many such states do are possible in state space? Well, it's 2 to the power n, because you see, there are n of these digits, and each one can be 0 or 1. So overall, you can think of 2 to the power n combinations. And that's the state space as opposed to this one electron space, which has n possibilities in there. Now, the Boltzmann law is stated in this state space. And what it says is, that the probability that the system will be in the ith state it depends on e to the power this quantity. 
And what is this quantity? Well, it involves the energy of the ith state and the number of electrons in the ith state and the thermal energy as in that Fermi function, the same kt. And what's this constant in front? Well, that constant should be chosen so that all the probabilities add up to 1 because the system must be in one state or another. So all the probabilities have to add up to 1. Now what I'll show you next is then how from this general law you can obtain the Fermi function. Because as I say, this is the most general law that applies to anything. Doesn't matter how complicated or simple. So let's take the simplest thing is system with just one level. So in the one electron space, there's just one state. Now, how many states in state space? Well, two to the power one, which is two. So you have a zero state and a one state. And to write down the Boltzmann law, I need the energy and the number of electrons for each one of those. So the number of electrons in the one state is one, in the zero state is zero. The energy for the zero state is zero. For the one state is whatever the energy level is, epsilon one. So we can now write down the E minus mu n over kT. For the zero state, it's zero. For the one state, it's epsilon one minus mu divided by kT. So now we are ready to write down the probabilities. So the probability of the zero state is one over z. Why 1 over z? Well, because e to the power 0 is 1. Now, the probability of the 1 state, well, that's e to the power minus x1 over z, where we define this dimensionless quantity x1 as epsilon 1 minus mu over kt. Well, then how do I find z? Well, the idea is that the two probabilities must add up to 1 because this system has only two possibilities. So the probability of zero and the probability of one, together they must make one. And so when I write P0 plus P1, I get one plus e to the power minus x1 divided by z, and that must equal one, which tells me that z must be one plus e to the power minus x1. So now we can take this and substitute it back and write P1 as e to the power minus x1 divided by z, which is 1 plus e to the power minus x1. And with a little bit of algebra, we can write it in this form. So what we did is took the numerator and denominator and both multiplied both by e to the power plus x1. And that's how we obtained this, which you will recognize as the Fermi function that I had stated before. Right. Now, what people, so what I've shown you then is that starting from Boltzmann law, when I apply it to a simple system, I get the Fermi function. Now, sometimes in this, in the Fermi function, people approximate it with e to the power minus x1. That is, they say, well, if x is much greater than 1, then I can drop the 1, and then this will become e to the power minus x1. And that's often referred to as the Boltzmann approximation. And if you have taken courses in semiconductor devices, you have probably seen it and used it extensively. But I want to stress again that the Boltzmann law we are going to talk about in this course is not this Boltzmann approximation, because this is just an approximation to the Fermi function. What we are talking about is a very general law from which Fermi function is just one special case of that law. Now, just as we wrote down the Fermi function, we could also evaluate the probability that the system will be in state zero. And that, as you might expect, will be one minus F1, because F1 is the probability of finding an electron in that state, in that level. So one minus F1 is the probability of not finding one, which means the probability that the system will be in the zero state. So all this now follows straight from the Boltzmann law. So in the rest of this lecture, let me go through a little more complicated example involving two energy levels. So supposing 
we got two states in the one electron space. So we got two levels essentially. Each one can be zero or one. So in this system then, I could label all the different states as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. 0, 0 means both are empty. 0, 1 means first one's empty, second one's full. This is first one's full, second one's empty. And this is where both are full. Now to apply the Boltzmann law, I need to write down E minus mu n over kt for each one of these possibilities. So let's first write down the n's. So what's the number of electrons? Well, if it's 0, 0, there are no electrons. If it's 0, 1 or 1, 0, there's one electron. If it is 1, 1, then there's two electrons because both are full. So those are the n's. What about the energy? Well, if no, there's no electrons there, energy is 0. If, the, if it's 0, 1, then the energy is epsilon 1. If it's 1, 0, the energy is epsilon 2. And if it's 1, 1, then it's like epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. So now you can fill out the E minus mu n over kt. So 0, 0, that's easy. E minus mu n over kt is just 0. The next one is epsilon 1 minus mu over kt. Because remember, n is equal to 1. So for E, I put epsilon 1, n is equal to 1, so I get this. With epsilon 2, I get this. Now, what about 1, 1? Well, now the energy is epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, but n is 2. So now I have to subtract 2 mu from it. And the corresponding quantity then is epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 minus 2 mu over kt. Well, now I can fill out the probabilities. The p0, 0, that's easy. It's 1 over z because e to the power 0 is 1. P01, that's e to the power minus x1 over z, where x1 denotes this quantity. P10, that's e to the power minus x2 over z, where x2 denotes this quantity here. And finally, this quantity here, you'll notice is actually the sum of x1 and x2. And so the P11 involves e to the power minus x2 times e to the power minus x1 divided by z. Okay, now what's the next step? Well, now I have to find z. How do I do it? Well, I require all probabilities to add up to 1. So I have to add all four of these and the answer should be 1, which means just like before, z should be equal to the sum of the numerators, which is 1 plus e to the power minus x1 plus e to the power minus x2 plus e to the power minus x2 times e to the power minus x1. So it's the sum of all four numerators is equal to z. And just to simplify the algebra a little, I've given them a name. This exponential of minus x1, I call it y1. In e to the power minus x2, well, that's y2. And e to the power minus x2 times e to the power minus x1, well, that's the typo. It should have been y2 times y1. Now, so I can easily factorize this and I can write it as 1 plus y2 times 1 plus y1. You can see that when you multiply that out, you'll get 1 plus y1 plus y2 plus y1 times y2. So now when I put that back in here, I'll get p11 as e to the power minus x2 times e to the power minus x1. And the denominator is 1 plus y2 times 1 plus y1, which amounts to, remember I had written y2 for e to the power minus x2 and y1 for e to the power minus x1. So 1 plus y2 times 1 plus y1. Now what you'll notice is that this is basically the Fermi function. You know, we can again, just like before, simplify this and write it as 1 over 1 plus e to the power plus x1. Okay? So this is really f1 and that's really f2. So what this shows is that when I apply the Boltzmann law, 
to this two level system you know the one with two electron two one electron levels so that it has four states in state space then if you ask the question what is p11 it gives you f1 f2 which is what you might have guessed because f1 is the probability one level is full f2 is the probability the other one is full so the probability that both are full is f1 times f2 but it comes straight out of the boltzmann law now if you want to write say p01 it'll be similar it look much the same except that now the numerator only has e to the power minus x1 so i don't have the e to the power minus x2 anymore and so i have a factor where the first one is f1 is the same fermi function but this one instead of being f2 what i've really got now is 1 minus f2 you can it's a little algebra you can check that this is indeed 1 minus that quantity and again, the result makes good sense because what's P01? You are asking what is the probability that one level is full and the other one is empty? Well, the chance that the first level is full, that's F1. The chance that the second level is empty, well, that's 1 minus F2. So the probability of finding the system in stage 01 is 1 minus F2 times F1. And you could go ahead and look at p10 and p00 as well and you'd get the answers you expected now what you might say is okay but then why am i bothering with the boltzmann law because all the information is there in the fermi functions and i could have written these down anyway without using the general law well the answer is that that's only true because we have assumed that the electrons are not interacting and so when you have two electrons the energy is really just the sum of what you get for one electron and that is what allows you to nicely factorize all the probabilities into separate fermi functions okay? but if they were interacting like then you'd have an extra term here you know something that would de denote the interaction energy between a pair of electrons. That's this U0. And then you wouldn't be able to factorize it so nicely. So you wouldn't be able to write your answers in terms of Fermi functions, but you'd still be able to use the Boltzmann law, this general law, which applies to, as I said, all systems, whether they're interacting or non-interacting, whether they're simple or complicated. But it's only when, for this special case of non-interacting electrons that you can factorize it nicely into Fermi function. But you might say, but then when I took my courses in solid state devices or solid state physics, we always use the Fermi functions, but electrons are interacting. So how did we get away with it? Well, the answer is that, well, the way people use the Fermi functions in this one electron space is using something called the mean field picture. And this is something we'll come back to in the last lecture of this week. We'll come back and connect up to this and explain how that mean field picture works. But right now, the main point I wanted to make is that the Boltzmann law is the general law that applies to any system and everything else kind of follows from it. This is really the, this is really the, central principle of equilibrium statistical mechanics and that's this boltzmann law which we just introduced and in the next lecture what i'll try to explain is where it comes from thank you